Dank Farrick, we're back. The Mandalorian blasts its way back to Disney Plus for the long-awaited season three, and already we're spotting more breadcrumbs leading us to the rise of the First Order and eventually Emperor Palpatine himself. Directed by Rick Famuyiwa, Chapter 17, The Apostate, finds Din Djarin kind of exactly where we left him, singularly focused on getting right with his religion while everybody around him is trying to rope him into situations he could care less about, including a couple of good old-fashioned shootouts with some dastardly space pirates and you might think they're your garden variety, uh, uh, cannon fodder, but these space pirates are a lot more important to the Star Wars canon than you might think and we'll break all of that down, plus we finally got an answer to whatever happened to Cara Dune. But before we get into all of that, I have to warn you, we are about to spoil all of the good stuff in this episode, so if you haven't seen it yet, or you just don't want to know, now is the time to punch it into hyperspace while we get into this. Okay, now that we're past the spoiler warning, let's get right into the main takeaways. The only thing Din Djarin cares about is redeeming himself in the eyes of his religion, the Children of the Watch. He checks back in with Grief Karga, who tries to persuade him to forget the religion and settle into the sweet life on Navarro as the new marshal there. This leads to a confrontation with a group of pirates, which does not go super great for the pirates. This of course leads to another confrontation with the pirates in orbit, which also does not end in their favor, which just makes them want to take out the Mandalorian more than ever. Now these specific pirates are new to the canon, we haven't seen them before, but at this point in the timeline, pirates and piracy play an important role in the future of the galaxy. We're going to break that down for you in just a minute, so hang out for that. First up, let's recap a little. Din and Grogu visit Din's sect, the Children of the Watch. They've built up their numbers since we last saw the armor and Paz Vizsla in The Mandalorian Season 2.5, aka the Book of Boba Fett. The armorer bestows a new helmet upon a young foundling. We bring this up because when they showed this helmet to the crowd at Star Wars Celebration last year, my producer was freaking out because he was convinced that it was a helmet for Grogu. It wasn't. It goes to this kid. Good for him, I guess. All right, whatever. We see this young foundling's initiation into the Creed, complete with a Mandalorian form of baptism and an attack by a giant space crocodile. Big old battle scene, all the Mandos get into the action and are on their way to getting wiped out when Din and Grogu pull up and put that sweet starfighter to use. Not Nearly as grateful as she should be about this, the armorer reminds Din that he's out of the Mandalorian Club since he broke his oath and popped his helmet off in season two and then admitted doing so. You know the deal from here. He's got to bathe in the waters of the mines of Mandalore, which probably don't even exist anymore since the Empire bombed the bejesus out of the whole planet decades ago during the Great Purge and the Night of a Thousand Tears. Despite the armorer telling Din that's basically impossible for him to be accepted back into the fold, Mando is like, cool, but I'm gonna actually go to Mandalore and do all that. The armorer is all like, this is the way, which is more her way of saying, okay, whatever, dude, go for it. And that's Din's big quest for season three, just like delivering Grogu to the Jedi was in season two. And when it comes to all of the grand sweeping good versus evil stuff that's constantly swirling about in the galaxy, Din could give a shit. He's got a quest and he's focused, there's only the quest, and everything else is just a distraction. So he and Grogu head off to Navarro, and on the way there, Grogu has a cute moment with the school of Pergil, just casually swimming through hyperspace, just like they did the last time we saw them in Star Wars Rebels. They make it to Navarro, which is way different than the last time we saw it, for real. It looks a lot like Batuu slash Black Spire Outpost slash Galaxy's Edge at the Disney parks. Anyway, High Magistrate Grief Karga is the man in charge, and he is definitely giving Bespin Lando Calrissian vibes here. Remember when noted Sabacc enjoyer and full-blown scoundrel Lando became a respectable businessman with a nice cape? Same deal here. Grief has gone straight and has leveraged Navarro's proximity to major hyperspace lanes to turn his little outpost into a nice little moneymaker, and it's working. 
So much so that Grief offers Dan and Grogu a prime new slot in Story Living by Disney Springs. Just kidding, he offers him a nice tract of land over by the Hot Springs. Grief needs a marshal, since Cara Dune casually got recruited by New Republic Special Forces, which is why we never see her anymore. Wink. Was I supposed to say wink or actually wink? But once again, Din Djarin doesn't care about any of this, even if Grief's offer sounds pretty sweet. He's got a quest, gotta do the quest, the quest is all that matters, and that quest brought him back to Navarro because he needs a droid. And there's only one droid he's ever trusted, and that's IG-11, whose non-functioning ass is now a statue in the center of town. The Imperial Remnant isn't really a problem for Navarro anymore. Moff Gideon got scooped up by a New Republic War Tribunal and nobody has seen him since, but we do see Vane, a Nikto space pirate with a small gaggle of fellow pirates. These guys are what's left of Grief Karga's old life and they don't seem to appreciate that he's gone legit these days. So once again, these pirates play into the larger story of the Star Wars canon. We'll break that down in just a second. Don't go away, they're more important than you think. Anyway, so Vane is really, really insistent on drinking alcohol at a grade school, which honestly sounds terrible, not to mention creepy. This results in Grief and Mando shooting them all, except Vane, who's off to go tattle to the Pirate King, Gorian Shard. Grief Karga may have gone legit, but he can still get down when he needs to. You can't be any geek off the street. You gotta be handy with the steel, you know what I mean? Earn your keep. Regulators! Mount up! Anyway, Grief wants Mando to be the lawman in Navarro and get paid well for it, but of course, Mando instead wants to reanimate IG-11's corpse to help him out in the ruins of Mandalore. So they are able to get IG-11 up and running, but it turns out to be a pretty bad idea as the droid reverts to its original programming and immediately gives us Terminator 1 vibes as he tries to eliminate Grogu. <laughs> Hey, you remember my best boy, Babu Frick? <laughs> yeah, that's him. Well, he's an Anzillion, who are known to be some of the best droidsmiths in the galaxy, and Grieve's got some working on Navarro. Grogu loves these little nuggets as much as I do. Anyway, they take a look at IG-11's remains and are like, yeah, no, we can't fix him without a new memory circuit. Super tough to find for these out-of-production IG models. Then this happens. <laughs> Not a pet. No, a squeeze me! Not squeeze, not squeeze! Bad baby. Disney, if you make just this into a show, I will watch it and buy everything. Anyway, Din and Grogu take off and do a little quick navigation lesson. I hope this means Grogu gets to learn to pilot a ship at some point this season. But Vane, the pirate who loves getting sauced at elementary schools, returns with some buddies and gives chase, once again resulting in Din showing what that N1 starfighter can really do with a skilled pilot in the cockpit. Vane is able to lure Din to a huge pirate ship captained by the Pirate King, Gorian Shard, who looks like a new species resembling Davy Jones crossed with Marvel Comics Man-Thing crossed with whatever is currently in my garbage disposal. Like I mentioned earlier, neither Vane nor Gorian Shard are specific characters we've seen in canon before. We'll see just how many problems they can cause for Din and Grogu, but on a larger scale, space piracy is a big problem in the Star Wars galaxy around this period and beyond. Keep in mind, this is now a good decade after the Empire's fall at the end of Return of the Jedi, the New Republic government is in place, and aside from conveniently removing Cara Dune from any on-camera adventures, got a real problem trying to control all the piracy going on. You see a lot of this in Star Wars Resistance, Dave Filoni's third and probably least loved animated Star Wars series. Only ran for two seasons, but there's some good story meat in there when it comes to space pirates and the indirect role they play in the eventual rise of the First Order. During this period, the New Republic is largely demilitarized, or is at least in comparison to the Empire that came before it. During the Imperial Era, Space pirates were either roped into the Empire's dealings, just like the crime syndicates and scummy bounty hunters were from time to time, or they were just obliterated completely. After the rise of the New Republic, it became a much larger problem that the new government was less adept at keeping at bay. 
This is all on display in Star Wars Resistance. Pirates swoop in and cause problems for just about everybody. And when the New Republic can't really handle the problem, here comes this new group offering private security contracts along with the ordinance to back it up. What's this group called? The First Order. The First Order rises to power in large part thanks to the piracy problem and the New Republic's inability to deal with it. They swoop in, offer protection for a price, and if you say no, well, guess what happens then? The Mandalorian has already laid a lot of track when it comes to the Imperial Remnant and the eventual return of Sheev Palpatine. Grogu himself and his little midichlorians have already been looped into that. This space pirate situation is just another step in that direction, giving a visceral first-hand look at why the New Republic was usurped by the Empire 2.0. But I digress back to the recap. When the pirates attack in space, Din and Grogu easily get away and set a course to Kalevala, a moon in the Mandalorian system, the seat of House Kreese. This is the first time we've ever seen it on screen. Din lands inside the castle and Bo-Katan is lounging on a throne, looking miserable and staring into nothing. Is this what she does all day? Din announces he wants to join up with her and trek out to Mandalore, and she pretty bitterly tells him she has no forces to join. All her supporters dispersed as mercenaries when she came back without the Darksaber. She tells Din he's free to command them with the Darksaber if he feels like it. She says the Children of the Watch basically ruined any hope of the Mandalorian restoration anyway, and they argue back and forth of whether bathing in the water beneath the mines of Mandalore is dumb superstition or not, and she directs him to exactly where he needs to go. Bo-Katan seems like she's totally given up, but either way, relations are not great between her and Mando, so once he figures out where he needs to go, once he reaches Mandalore, he and Grogu bail. Din didn't care about her little revolution anyway. He was just using the situation to get the Mandalore, and as the episode comes to a close, that's where he and Grogu head off to next. I wonder what horrors await them there. But what did you think of the long-awaited return of the Mandalorian? Are these pirates going to be more of a problem than Mando bargained for? And what is Bo-Katan really up to? Can't imagine she's just gonna sit there and be mad forever. Let us know what you think in the comments. Anyway, thanks for watching this episode of Cannon Fodder. I'm Kim Horcher, and for more Mando, here's his whole journey from humble bounty hunter to wielder of the freaking Darksaber. So make sure to check that out, and don't forget to follow and subscribe to IGN wherever you like to watch.